everything Dark Souls is known for was introduced in Demon's Souls. The deliberate combat, challenging but fair difficulty, minimalist story presentation, looping level design, shortcuts, and the asynchronous multiplayer elements. Everything, except one thing. The interconnected world layout. FromSoft has made many sequels, others have made even more clones, but none have succeeded in copying, let alone improving, the design of the world layout in the ways I value. What are these ways, and how do the worlds of the Souls games compare? This is what I'll show you, and I've made a few diagrams to help me explain. I'll quickly cover the key terms here. Mechanics consist of rules that define how game objects act. One example is dodge rolling in Dark Souls, which causes the player character to move and dodge. Systems consist of objects and mechanics, connected by behaviors. Continuing the example, rolling is part of the movement and stamina systems, which cyclically affect each other. Rolling spends stamina, which limits further rolling, forming a loop. These are subsystems of the combat system, which is in turn a subsystem of the game, which can also be thought of as a system. This is an example of a system hierarchy, where each subsystem forms a whole, with a combined behavior and purpose. This is called emergence. So, gameplay emerges from the mechanics and systems of the game during play, and the player's experience emerges from that. Of course this is affected by non-gameplay elements as well. Games vary a lot on the degree to which they rely on systems. The spectrum goes from heavily directed, often cinematic experiences, to sim games. Here are some examples. State space simply means all the possible arrangements of the game's elements. The sum of all states that can occur. It's crucially important to distinguish which of these states are relevant. If two different states are functionally identical. One of them is redundant to gameplay. An example would be a case where two weapons have different graphics, but the same stats and movesets. Next, we can consider only the states that the players can achieve through play, and which ones come up when the players try to achieve their goals. These remaining states are the relevant ones. In other words, this is the depth of the game. So. If a game element is poorly balanced, making it irrelevant, the depth of the game is reduced. High depth prevents the game from getting solved, and thus boring. Efficient design maximizes depth by leveraging the interactions of elements and avoiding their overlap, instead of just adding more stuff. It leads to games that are easy to learn, but hard to master. Players have unique motivations for playing games. But these preferences can be roughly categorized. I'll use this one by Nick Yi and Quantic Foundry for my evaluation. To start us off, I tried to list all Dark Souls 1 gameplay elements and interactions that I could think of in a reasonable time, and created an interactive graph based on them using vis.js. Each node is a game element, and the color corresponds to the higher level system it belongs to. The division of elements into systems is not exact, it's just the interpretation I chose. Many could fit into multiple systems, but this would be hard to show in the graph. Here are the high-level systems, created by clustering the elements. Edges between the nodes describe behaviors and relations between the systems. We'll focus on the world system. Unclustering the world system reveals the elements that it contains, and shows the linked behaviors in more detail. Here it contains the level geometry, bonfires, bloodstains, messages, and signs. To see more detailed interactions with the other elements, we can start unclustering the other high-level systems. The graph quickly becomes crowded and hard to show on video, but let's do it fast anyway.
this interactive graph can be viewed on the page I've linked in the video description. I recommend filtering out systems or behavior types you don't wish to show, so you can see what's going on. When reading the graph, it should be noted that the behaviors are not equally complex. A collision check with a hitbox has more going on than a simple stats change. Additionally, the graph does not consider that the number of equipment and spells the player can equip and attune is limited, so the number of behaviors is exaggerated if you think about the options available at once. Filtering out the item and equipment systems gives an idea what the system interactions look like when limiting or ignoring their use. It's also possible to filter out all behaviors except the ones you want to see. So we could show only combat actions, movement, resource change, stats change, or utility actions. In this video, we'll look at how the world affects the game's systems and the resulting gameplay. For example, the world geometry defines how the player and the NPCs can move and therefore greatly affects the combat. A large portion of the combat's depth is based on the different environments and where enemies are placed. Cramped corridors and walkways restrict movement, making it harder to circle around or back away from enemies. Walls can block weapon swings, but also projectiles shot by enemies. The world directly or indirectly influences all the other systems of the game, making it very significant to the gameplay. In the next chapters, we'll look at this effect in detail and distinguish between more and less interconnected worlds. What is meant by an interconnected world layout? To me, it's a Metroidvania-style, non-linear world, where areas have multiple connections between them. Backtracking is sometimes required, but looping level design ensures that you often end up where you started, without backtracking. The world may start quite linear, but gets increasingly non-linear and interconnected, as shortcuts are opened in and between areas. Some sections can be more linear and act as bottlenecks for progress. Interconnectivity and linearity are spectrums, and I think Lord Run from Dark Souls 1 belongs in the heavily interconnected end, while the worlds of the other Souls games are mixed in this aspect. This will be discussed in detail later. Interconnectivity, combined with nonlinear progress, increases the depth of the game in two main ways. By increasing the number of systems, and by increasing the ways you can access and complete areas to progress in the world. We can try visualizing the number of relevant gameplay combinations when entering a location in a linear world. The equipment and inventory loadout combinations depend on the available gear in the previous areas. There is only one way to access the location. For the sake of keeping the visualization reasonable, Let's say that you have three relevantly different weapons, two armor sets, and four inventories of items and spells. This results in 24 total combinations. With an interconnected world, there are often multiple directions to access areas. The number of combinations can then be multiplied by the directions. The most common one is two, so let's use it here. This results in twice as many scenarios. More approach directions is not the only result from an interconnected layout. If the world can be progressed non-linearly, this means you can access an area in many different parts of the game, with a varying number of other areas completed beforehand. This increases the number of loadouts and inventories available. Let's say this again doubles the number of relevant ways you can tackle an area. This has already increased the number of combinations to 96, and this is a gross oversimplification of the actual in-game case. As one example from Dark Souls, you can access Darkroot Garden from three different directions. You can access it at the start, or after visiting basically all other places in the game, giving you countless character builds to choose from. It should be said that if you access the location in the late game, it does not really matter what build you use, since the difficulty level is more tuned to early mid-game. In the more linear games, giving the player a selection of different starting characters and items to choose from is a good way to increase variety in the early game. 
A more concrete way to show how the world layout affects gameplay is to dissect the different gameplay loops that form as a result of the layout. Here we focus on the first playthrough experience. This diagram divides the looping progress in Dark Souls to the area level and to the world level. The world of Lordran is divided into areas that have a name and usually one or more boss enemies that often need to be beaten in order to progress. The player starts from a checkpoint bonfire and proceeds to explore the area and beat or avoid enemies they encounter. If they proceed far enough, they face the area boss and probably die on the first try. They respawn at the bonfire and repeat the loop, during which they may find a shortcut or backtrack to a bonfire. This repeats until they give up and try another path or beat the boss. Alternatively, they may backtrack or decide to explore further if no shortcut is available. Dying here means they need to navigate back to the same spot to recover the dropped souls, so it can be risky to explore an unknown location. After finding a bonfire, the player can rest, level up and kindle the bonfire if they wish. Then the loop starts again. Now they can explore the current area more, or travel back to the hub area of Firelink Shrine, or to an NPC, such as a blacksmith. There they can talk and trade with the NPCs, and possibly reinforce their equipment. Then the player may start exploring again, or travel back to the old area, and possibly discover paths to new locations. At any point, they may backtrack, or stumble upon a new path that leads to a new location, or back to a familiar one. There's a large amount of freedom in the exploration, since you can switch between the different loops. We'll come back to this diagram later. Before we go any further into analyzing and comparing world layouts, you might be asking, what aspects of gameplay and player experience are affected by the world layout? You may be indifferent to or actively dislike the additional world navigation challenge, but enjoy the added immersion provided by the cohesive world. Regardless, I would argue that almost all the different player experience groups are affected by the world layout design. Each experience group can be thought of as a spectrum from low to high focus on the experience in question, such as the challenge provided, going from easily approachable light fun to more skill-based. Making the world interconnected changes the focus on these spectrums, but it's not necessarily a trade-off in every case. While it certainly makes understanding and navigating the world more challenging, allowing the game to be completed by traversing the world in creative ways does not diminish the casual playthrough experience. I'll show you how the section of the provided experience spectrum changes when the world is made more interconnected by moving its upper and lower bounds. The experience provided by a less interconnected world is shown by a blue border and the interconnected one by a red border. If the bound moves, it means the focus moves away from offering that type of experience. If the subspectrum widens, it means there is a wider range of experiences offered. The opposite is true when the bounded section narrows. Let's start with the discovery and strategy spectrums. We already looked at the interconnected world exploration and progress loops, so now let's condense them to a simple loop containing the essential experience. First, you explore the world and discover new areas. After finding connecting shortcuts between areas, you begin to understand the layout and remember the main paths. With this information, you can plan your route through the world, choosing the shortest or the easiest path to the place you want to go. Then you navigate there and probably need to correct your course at some point if you got lost on the way. Making the world more interconnected and non-linear allows the player to explore and discover locations, items and other hidden secrets more freely. Once you know how the pieces of the world fit together, you can start planning your next moves rather than simply following the only path forward or staring at the minimap quest marker. You may need to stop and think what the optimal route is. 
Maybe you want to skip a difficult area for now, fetch a useful item from another area, and upgrade your weapon on the way. As a new player, you may have doubts on progressing too far from the familiar areas, as you cannot simply warp back once you have rested at the faraway bonfire. Getting back can be even more difficult, and you may be stuck there for a while. When you encounter a path that is too difficult or blocked, you'll make a mental note of returning there later. This is a driving force for curiosity, as you know that something interesting is locked away, and you need to explore more to eventually access it. This freedom for the player to plan their route and build their character allows them to express themselves. Backtracking and exploring old areas naturally leads the player to notice their power level and skill increasing, as they can easily beat previously difficult obstacles. On the other hand, if you prefer a more straightforward experience and don't want to think about the consequences of choosing where to go and when, you might prefer a more linear world. This takes us to the challenge spectrum. Difficulty is perhaps overemphasized when talking about the Souls games, but an appropriate level of challenge is important. Otherwise, the game will be too boring or too frustrating. Interconnected design causes navigation in the world to be more challenging because of the increased number of options. However, the difficulty level will also vary more since the world can be explored in a non-linear order. Some areas will be too difficult due to the lack of player character power and player skill. Later on, the opposite can be true as you visit areas that were meant to be explored early or backtrack through old ones with more experience. Giving too many options to players at the start is confusing, but there are ways to make the beginner-friendly paths the most obvious ones, while leaving room for exploration and for replay. In Dark Souls 1, this is done by making the other paths harder to spot and clearly more difficult. Of course, you won't know that a path is more difficult until you've tried an easier one. To avoid frustrating players, it's possible to make the more advanced routes require advanced movement or knowledge about the world to access them. For example, in Super Metroid, the wall jump can be used from the start to access places you would normally get to much later, and in other wilds, you need to understand how the world works to proceed. It's very important to clearly signal to the player when they cannot proceed through an area or a gate yet. Marking the place with something memorable helps a lot in reminding the player to return there later on. One difficulty curve flattening aspect of multiple paths is that the player is not forced to complete the one they find too difficult right away. Maybe explore Darkroot Garden before trying to beat the gargoyles, and so on. It helps if all locations, including optional ones, have something useful to find. At least the player can train their skills and gain some levels before returning to the more challenging part. Like the varying challenge, the excitement level of nonlinear exploration varies more. The highs are higher, but the lows are also lower. Overall, the experience is lower paced due to more time spent on figuring out where to go next and then traveling there. However, I would argue that the most thrilling moments are elevated due to higher stakes, such as not being able to warp back after defeating a boss. The relief of finding a shortcut back to familiar ground is equally great. The replayability provided by a deep, interconnected world helps in keeping up a community of players long after release. One competitive way to play the game is speedrunning, where the goal is to complete the game as fast as possible under some constraints. A more non-linear world provides a difficult speedrunning challenge, as the large number of different routes and possible builds is huge, especially in categories like all bosses, where you need to visit almost all the locations. Just finding the shortest path for visiting the areas is difficult, but you also need to consider enemies, what items and equipment to get, and how to use them. We can also place the different world layouts on the systemic richness spectrum we looked at earlier. When the world is interconnected, the player needs to engage with the bonfire checkpoint system. 
Resting at the bonfire causes you to respawn there, and also warps you there when a homeward bone or a miracle is used. This is one reason not to rest at the bonfire, if you want to quickly return to another bonfire. In addition to refilling your resources, resting will also respawn enemies, so you may sometimes decide not to rest if you know you'll be backtracking soon. Kindling bonfires to increase healing they provide is also a system that fits better to an interconnected world, where you can strategically kindle a bonfire in an important location. Firekeepers can also be killed to extinguish the bonfire, making it unusable but providing you with the firekeeper's soul, which can be used to boost healing. It should be noted that the already mentioned discovery and design spectrums are not limited to exploring the world. When new systems are introduced, it adds new interactions for the player to discover and experiment with. This enables more personal expression and customization, as the player chooses how they engage with the systems. Maybe they'll kindle all the bonfires they can, or always return to a single one, which has the full 20 esters. Killing a firekeeper may be useful for the heal boost, but has implications for the next two spectrums, fantasy and story. Purely systemic games can be quite abstract, but when the systems simulate real-world phenomena on some level, they help in making the world more immersive, as the world reacts to your actions like you'd expect. If the world locations fit together cohesively and make sense, it elevates the sense of place compared to areas just being glued together. A more freely explorable world certainly helps in conveying the adventure fantasy, as you can get lost and isolated from the hub area. This is enhanced by making some areas more difficult to find and not required for completing the game, truly giving you the sense of discovery, as that is what you actually did. Found a place without being railroaded there. When the world progress is open-ended, so is the narrative. As mentioned, there are different ways games tell stories. They are not limited to traditional exposition through cutscenes and dialogue. The game's mechanics and systems contribute to the narrative experience. On a high level, the main gameplay loops of exploration and combat convey an experience of failing and trying again and again, persisting and beating seemingly insurmountable odds. This matches quite well with the explicit narrative of a chosen cursed undead being reborn again and again until the quest is fulfilled. Single mechanics and systems can also tell their own stories. Coming back to the Firekeepers, one of the most memorable parts of Dark Souls is climbing up from Blight Town and finally getting back to Firelink, only to see the bonfire snuffed out. This fits more to the category of developer-planned systemic storytelling, but there's lots of room for unique player stories that emerge from interaction of the systems and the player. Looking at all the spectrums, increased interconnectivity generally broadens the provided experience and transfers some control from the designer to the player. As we now understand the basic influence of the world layout, I'd like to cover one design choice that seems to greatly influence the world layout design and start comparing the Souls worlds. Let's look at the world layout diagrams of Dark Souls 1 and 3. I'll show the locations of the games in the order they become accessible through normal gameplay. I'm not including skips. Dark Souls starts in the tutorial area of Northern Undead Asylum, from which the player travels to Lordran, the land that is explored for most of the game. Firelink Shrine functions as a hub area that connects to multiple other locations, allowing the player to quickly return there later. The paths available at the start include three options, but it's also possible to return to the tutorial area, which now has different enemies and items. At this point, the world branches out greatly and loops back to Firelink. The objective is to ring two bells, one in Undead Paris and one in Quelag's domain, but the player can freely explore other areas if they are skilled enough. The Valley of Greaks connects different parts of the world together. Each color represents a set of locations the player can access at that stage of the game, before a bottleneck, which can be a mandatory area or an item needed to proceed. The shade of an area's color indicates if a previous location needs to be completed before it can be accessed. The darker the shade, the more previous locations need to be linearly completed. For example, the only way to access depths is to beat the Capra Demon in Lower Undead Burg, so depth is marked with the darker shade. Oppositely, you don't need to complete Blight Town to access the Great Hollow, you can just beat a section of it, so the color shade stays the same. 
The arrows indicate if a connection allows the player to traverse in both directions, the only one-way connection being the drop to the abyss. Warp or cutscene connections are indicated by a dashed line, and connections that do not allow full access to an area are marked with the dotted line, the only case here being the coffin cutscene transfer from the catacombs to the tomb of the giants. The next major bottleneck is Sense Fortress, followed by Anor Londo. After the Lord Vessel is placed on the altar, the orange fog doors open and allow passage to the rest of the four lords. Ariamis can be accessed before this, but most players probably find it later. The kiln is the final area of the game, accessed after defeating the four lords. Some locations also have local shortcuts, shown by the inner arrows. A large portion of the early game areas are optional, although you need to go through either depths or the Valley of Drakes. Now let's see the diagram of Dark Souls 3. The game starts in the tutorial area and proceeds to the hub area of Firelink Shrine. This time you only have a single path available and it is only accessible by warping. The player is flown down from the high wall and can pass through Undead Settlement to three other locations. After defeating the Abyss Watchers, the way to the catacombs and the smoldering lake is opened. Three new locations become available after Volnir is defeated and the small doll is recovered from the Cathedral of the Deep. Anor Londo is accessible after Sullivan is defeated. After three Lords of Cinder are finished, the player is warped to the entrance of Lothric Castle, and after Dancer of the Boreal Valley is defeated, Lothric Castle and Consumed King's Garden can be accessed. It is possible to fight Dancer early by killing the NPC Emma and get access to the areas that way. Untended graves and a dark version of Firelink Shrine can be explored after the King's Garden. The gesture for traveling to Arch Dragon Peak can also be acquired at the end of the garden. The Grand Archives can be reached once Dragon Slayer armor is slain. After all the four Lords of Cinder are defeated, the final area can be warped to. There are some locations with excellent use of shortcuts and a few side areas are optional. There are fewer locations, but more bottlenecks than in Dark Souls 1. The areas themselves are often larger and have multiple paths and shortcuts, but the world layout is greatly simplified. A good way to illustrate this branch-like layout is to rearrange the diagram to this binary tree style. There are never more than two branching paths from a single location, and they never loop back to different areas which would allow access from different directions. You sometimes hear an argument that if you don't like being able to warp from the start of the game, then just don't do it. There's a whole other discussion to be had on this type of self-imposed rules and letting the player do the game design on behalf of the designer, but we are not covering it here. We'll just focus on the default gameplay, where the player is expected to use whatever tools available. I would actually be quite okay with this voluntary restriction, if it were the only issue, but the whole world design seems to completely change once warping is allowed. The first half of Dark Souls 1 would still work fine and have a non-linear progress, even with warping enabled right from the start. It would remove the main reason for understanding the world layout though, as navigation between locations would be lost. Shortcuts become meaningless, since you can just click on the location you wish to travel to in a menu. Shortcuts inside locations would still matter, as long as there are not too many bonfires that make even them pointless. This is why the concept of relevant depth is important. Looking back at the exploration and navigation loop, the only thing that remains is the exploration of the locations themselves and finding the way forward to the next area, or an occasional side area. Even though the newer Souls games have nicely interconnected locations, the navigation inside a single location does not come close to learning Lordran inside out. There is a mini version of this loop inside areas, but it is also diminished by allowing warping. If you want to try what it feels like to play a Souls game with no carefully crafted world design or level design, you can try the Chalice Dungeons of Bloodborne. Again, if the worlds with warping were as interconnected and would allow as non-linear progress as Dark Souls 1, I would be more okay with warping. However, it really seems that the world layouts have become more linear as a byproduct, restricting the options for progressing, 
and thus reducing the depth and the replay value. So, the thing that gets me is the one-two punch of removing the adventure of the first playthroughs and the long-term replayability. I hope you still remember the world and area progress loop diagram for Dark Souls 1, since we'll now compare it to Dark Souls 3. Starting from a bonfire again, the player begins to explore the area and beat enemies they encounter. They face the boss, most likely die, and repeat the loop, during which they may find a shortcut or backtrack to a bonfire. Eventually, they defeat the boss, and a bonfire is spawned, which they light, and warp back to the hub area. There they can talk and trade with NPCs, level up, and reinforce equipment. Then the player can warp back and proceed to the next location, keep exploring the old area, or sometimes find a side area. Clearly, the loops are simpler and the progress is more straightforward. There are fewer overlapping loops compared to Dark Souls 1, where the player could switch between areas when stumbling upon new places and shortcuts. Instead, the player is directed to beat the locations in order, while occasionally giving a single side area to explore. The Dark Souls 3 world layout feels like someone played Dark Souls, and thought that the best thing about the interconnected world was that you could see places you will later go to, and where you came from. The design is great for grand vistas. You get a nice view of Lothric at the start, and the various landmarks are ever present. Their positions in the world are also quite accurate, which cannot be said from certain other games in the series. Nice views require long distances, so perhaps that was one aspect that pushed the world to have larger areas, where warping helps in avoiding long walks. But maybe FromSoft just arrived at a more directed linear approach for other reasons, like easier development, bigger market appeal, and focusing on other aspects. Daxos 1 is a good case study on how the world layout can be designed without warping, with heavy use of looping connections between locations, verticality, and relatively short distances. I've run the longest distance required on the background, which is the trip from the Bell of Quelag's domain to Sen's Fortress. This takes only 6 minutes. Dark Souls 1 also introduces warping when it makes sense, when the world has opened up and distances between the four ends have become longer. Before this, the only major dead ends are the three orange fog gates and Ash Lake, so long backtracking trips are not required elsewhere. It is a good idea to allow fast travel at the end of a long path, where the point is to have a long journey away from the hub and the known locations. In this case, looping back would undermine the experience of being far away from home. The world does not necessarily need to be small and interconnected, or large and have warping. You could increase the player's movement options as the world expands, to shorten the backtracking times and to make traversal more engaging. After all, I don't think that most people constantly fast travel in Spider-Man as the web swinging is so enjoyable. Now wouldn't it be cool if there were a game like Dark Souls, but with more movement options, perhaps something enabling more vertical movement, maybe not a web shooter exactly, but perhaps a rope of some kind, with the hook at the end. The world layout would probably be the most vertical we've ever seen, and have no reason for warping due to the faster movement. To drive home the difference between the layouts of Dark Souls 1 and 3, Let's see how a hypothetical Dark Souls 1 would look like, if it were made with the same approach as Dark Souls 3. The start is the same, but instead of four starting paths, there is one that leads to an area called Undead Town, that is Undead Burg and Paris massed together. Here you ring the first bell to proceed. A single path leads down to Depths, which has a side area called Darkroot Forest. The path continues through Blight Town to Quelax Domain where the second bell is rung. A way to forgotten remains is opened, where you fight the bed of chaos. The Valley of Greaks leads you to the two other lords, and you still require the Covenant of Artorias Ring from Darkroot to access the abyss. Once you get the third lord soul, you are warped to Sen's Fortress. Here you can learn a Chester to warp to a side area. Beating Ornstein and Smaug grants access to the Cavern Archives, where the last lord soul is acquired. The ending works as usual in the kiln. Let's also do the opposite, by seeing how the Dark Souls 3 layout would look like with the Dark Souls 1 design philosophy. The start is the same again, 
except now Firelink Shrine connects to two locations. The world branches out heavily after this point, looping back to Firelink and other areas. Road of Sacrifices functions as a connecting area, like the Valley of Drakes in Dark Souls 1. After getting the small doll and beating Abyss Watchers, Irithil opens as usual, but the other areas loop back to earlier locations. The main path to Lothric Castle would open after getting three cinders, but there could again be a way to access it earlier. Accessing Arc Dragon Beak would work the same, and so would the ending. Warping back to Firelink could be allowed from the far ends of the world, but otherwise it would not be needed. This would require Firelink's Shrine to be closer to the center of the world, and leveling up at bonfires would need to be allowed to avoid excessive backtracking. To discuss alternative ways of handling warping, let's move to the next topic. Uh, let's address one world design decision that seems to be a major factor behind enabling warping from the start. The hub area, where the player constantly returns to level up, talk and trade with NPCs, and so on. Dark Souls 1 is the outlier here, as you can warp to the hub in every other game. It makes the most sense in Demon's Souls, where the archstones warp you to separate sections of the world, but it is less justified in the other games, which are supposed to have interconnected worlds. I think there are more interesting ways of making the player return to the hub, one being the way Dark Souls 1 handled it. If you want to encourage the player to return to the hub more often, then the world design naturally guides them to. There are other ways than forcing them to level up there and requiring warping back and forth all the time. One way would be to allow warping back to the hub, but not the other way around, which would make the shortcuts useful again, but would not work very well if the hub does not have many connections, as you would end up running through the same path over and over again. This could be alleviated by adding more consumable items that allow warping, similar to Homeward Bones. Kingsfield has an item that you can place on a pedestal, Activating it as a warp point, making you choose where you can warp back to, and when to risk moving it. Many metroidvania games handle fast travel by only allowing it between dedicated fast travel spots. A similar solution could work here, and it is quite close to the way the last half of Dark Souls 1 handles warping. Warp access to a long list of bonfires is perhaps even too lenient, as warping between Honor Londo and Firelink, combined with allowing warping back from the Four Lords, would have sufficed. If you really want to have the player be always able to warp to and back from the hub, one way to do it would be limiting the warping to only between the current checkpoint and the hub. This way, the hub is always available, but you still need to understand and traverse the world. This has the added benefit of not requiring the hub to be in the center of the world, giving more freedom to the design. All this said, my favorite solution would still be just making the movement faster and more varied as the world expands. If you are used to fast travel, you might say that this sounds boring, but to me the most boring part is looking at the warping load screen. In Bloodborne, it took almost a minute to just warp to the hub and back, not including the time spent on skipping dialogue and browsing the warp menu. By that time, you would have almost arrived at your destination by sprinting through a shortcut in Dark Souls 1. This also allows you to spot possible changes in the world, like NPCs and items appearing in new places. This style of placing stuff on old paths continued to some extent in the sequels, but there you would probably just use a walkthrough to find them, as you would normally completely miss them by warping past them. Faster and expanded movement methods don't only speed up traversal, they also make it more challenging and interesting, as you can approach old routes in different ways, and maybe skip sections completely. One simple and fitting way to speed up would be transforming to some faster creature, like a wolf, some might say that this would not fit the grounded sword and board style of Dark Souls, but you can already turn into a dragon. Sure, it's a scuffed half dragon that can't fly, but this type of transformation is not out of the question. There are countless options, uh, it's just a matter of picking the fitting one for the world. Sekiro brought in proper jumping, wall jumping, crouching, sliding, swimming, and grappling. You can glide. Sealed surf, swim up waterfalls, and ride animals, and rocks in Breath of the Wild. 
At the least you'll get a horse in Elden Ring. I'll compare the original versions of all the games, which means no DLC and no remake for Demon's Souls or Scholar of the First Sin for Dark Souls 2. We'll go in release order. Demon's Souls starts with a skippable tutorial, where you can't return to later. If you beat the tutorial boss, you get a sneak peek of Dragon Guard, but it does not actually give you access to the area. Regardless, the player ends up in the Nexus, which is the hub area of the game. At first, you can only warp to Boletarian Palace. After Phalanx is defeated, all the other unbroken archstones can be accessed. Each one is a linear path that ends in an Arc Demon. Again, the shade of a location's color darkens here to indicate when a previous location needs to be completed before it can be accessed. The only bottleneck before the end is after the Tower Knight boss, as a fog wall prevents access to the final areas of Boletarian Palace until one of the Arch Demons is defeated. Once all Arch Demons are beaten, the end is below the Nexus. Some early locations have many shortcuts. None of the locations are optional, except the tutorial. Some say Demon's Souls is the most non-linear in the series. This depends on the linearity metrics you look at. It certainly gives you many paths to choose from, right at the start, and they can be completed in almost any order. On the other hand, the paths are linear and don't connect to other paths, as they are separate parts of the world. This is sometimes called hub and spoke level design, where separate paths or spokes start from the hub, and some may be unlocked later. And Dark Souls 1 does the hub and spoke to some extent as well, but it is less emphasized, as the different spokes connect to each other, and you don't return to the hub as often. As a side note, Undead Perk and New Londo are separated to upper and lower sections in this diagram. If you think this distorts the comparison, think of them as having more local shortcuts instead. Dark Souls 2 starts in a tutorial area, and continues to Majula, which is the hub area. There are two locations you can access, unless you count falling to the pit and dying as accessing the areas there. After beating the Dragon Rider, you can continue to No Man's Wharf, or talk to Lysia and buy access to Huntsman's Cops, or just kill her. When you have enough health or souls to buy the Silver Cat Ring, you can survive the fall to the pit and access areas there. The Shaded Woods path becomes available once you find a fragrant branch of yore. Once you have all the four old souls from the ends of the paths, you can pass Shrine of Winter. You can also pass if you happen to have one million soul memory. At the end of the path, you'll find the King's Ring, which opens various gates. The first one opens the path to Aldia's Keep. Ash and Mist Heart is given to you at the end of the path. It lets you access memories of the Ancients. After acquiring the giant's kinship, you can fight Nasandra in Throne of Want for the ending. There are some locations with shortcuts at the start of the game. Almost all the smaller side areas are optional. The start of Dark Souls 2 is similar to the hub and spoke style of Demon's Souls. Even though it is presented as more interconnected, the paths do not connect or connect very little between the spokes, which is more easily seen if we look at the first half and hide the side areas. The rest of the game is very linear, with some more open-ended parts, when you find the key items that allow access to multiple small areas. Bloodborne starts when the player wakes up at Josefka's clinic. New players will probably die to the wolf, and end up in Hunter's Dream, the hub area, separate from the rest of the world. The only area available at the start is Central Yarnam. The player also ends up there if they make it past the wolf. Once Gascoin is beaten, the secondary hub of Cathedral Ward can be accessed. Two other paths are open directly. Beating the Bloodstarred Beast opens the path to the Healing Church workshop, and allows kidnappers to bring the player to the Hypogean Jail. Defeating Amelia gives the password to the Forbidden Woods. Unfortunately, the player can't input the code, so there's no way to proceed by guessing or knowing the password some other way. Canehurst summons and the Tonsil Stone can be acquired now, giving access to Castle Canehurst and the lecture building. The main path continues to Yar Ghul after Rome. A key found in there opens the door to Upper Cathedral Ward. Beating the One Reborn lets the player enter the final areas. 
the game ends after the boss fights in the Hunter's Dream. There are multiple locations with heavy use of shortcuts, and almost half of the areas are optional. The layout is closer to the hub and spoke style than it first may seem. The game starts at the end of one spoke, and there are a couple connections between the spokes, making it hard to see. By removing two of the connections that are made redundant by warping, and looking at Cathedral Ward as the hub, it becomes clearer and seven spokes can be differentiated. Additionally, the access to the different spokes is limited by bottlenecks, making the world progress more linear. The number of local shortcuts is the highest among the Souls games, even if some of them are unremarkable. There is a tendency to overuse gates, doors and elevators that can be open or operated only from the opposite side. They are almost always telegraphed to the player, working as a nice reminder, but also ruining a lot of the surprise of finding a shortcut that you didn't even realize existed. This continued in Dark Souls 3 and a bit in Sekiro too. The more surprising shortcuts are rare. Demon Souls has good ones in Boletarian Palace and Stonefang. They are shown to you in advance, but since they blend into the world by actually making sense, you might not notice them at first. The most famous ones in Dark Souls 1 are the elevator back to Firelink and the ladder drop in Undead Burke. Other interesting explicit shortcuts are the elevator in Isolate, the spinning stair tower in Anor Londo, and the floodgate of New London Ruins. In general, many connections between the locations are surprising due to the maze-like layout of Lordran. Dark Souls 2 has some walls you can blow up, and this famous tree. The Laddersmith concept is interesting, and calling the ship to shore in No Man's Wharf is quite unique. There are very few moving parts in the Souls world. Bloodborne has the two unpredictable connections I showed. This gravestone is kinda like a goth version of the falling tree. In addition, all of the first four games have cage elevators that descend to unexpected places and many use secret bookcase doors. The double elevator in Undead Settlement of Dark Souls 3 is clever compared to the more common secrets hidden between floors. Finding the smoldering leg is quite a spectacle and later the ballista can break the ground, making you fall into the ruins. The Anor Londo Tower is a simplified version of the one in Dark Souls 1. Both Dark Souls 3 and Sekiro have some pseudo-connections that give a nice view to a previous location, but don't allow access to the full area. Sekiro also has the Shinobi Kites and some surprising alternative paths. I must mention some cool shortcuts in the DLCs. Dark Souls 2 has this snowball in Eleum Lois, and the ringed city of Dark Souls 3 has this falling tower that creates a bridge. These are more imaginative, but still just visually. Uh, what I would really like to see is more systems that enable interesting exploration. More mechanisms that transform the level geometry, or even the position and orientation of whole locations. And this could get disorientating fast, but would make understanding the world very rewarding. I would like this direction more than Souls being another timing-focused action game. We already looked at Dark Souls 3, so now let's see what the world layout in the Souls game with the most expressive and fast movement system looks like. Relax, Sekiro is fine, but the world layout is nothing special. Some areas are cool though, with nice use of verticality. Sekiro starts in Ashina Reservoir. Like Demon's Souls, you can beat the tutorial boss, but end up in the temple hub area regardless. The only path forward is Ashina outskirts. Hirata Estate can be accessed after the Bell Charm is found, and the Bell Demon's temple can be accessed early, if the player manages to pass the Headless. The gate to Ashina Castle can be passed, after Kyobu is no longer breathing. Blazing Bull needs to be defeated, before the main part of the castle can be accessed. This area functions as the second hub area. There are two parts to abandon dungeon, and one to sunken valley. After Puppeteer Ninjutsu is acquired, 
Sunken Valley Passage can be accessed from Senpo Temple. There are two parts to Ashina Depths, which end in Mibu Village. After two incense ingredients are gathered, Ashina Castle needs to be revisited. This time some parts are blocked, and new enemies have appeared. The game can already end here, depending on what the player chooses. If the player continues, Fountainhead Palace can be accessed when the Mortal Blade and ingredients are ready. After the Dragon's Tears are collected, Ashina Castle is visited one final time, and the game ends where it began, in the Reservoir. Only half of the areas have traditional shortcuts. The only fully optional areas are Hirata Estate and Fountainhead Palace, although they are mandatory to get some of the endings. As I said, Sekiro continues the trend of teasing you with shortcuts and early access to areas that are there just for the nice view. To be fair, these shortcuts wouldn't matter anyway due to warping, so it's probably best to just leave them like this instead of doing what Bloodborne did. Regardless, here's a quick redesign of the layout that would make the start of the game less linear. Firstly, allow the player to fully access Senpo Temple if they pass the headless. I don't think many new players would accidentally end up there, and it would make for an interesting path for approaching Ashina Castle from another direction. Similarly, allow access to Sunken Valley from Ashina outskirts, maybe after acquiring an item or beating a mini boss. This way, letting the player climb up from Sunken Valley would present another path to the castle. That's it, we covered all the worlds. There's no single clear evolution or trend, but we'll look at some metrics to understand the differences better. You can see why the Lost Bastille, Central Yarnum, Cathedral of the Deep, Irithil, and Ashina Castle are some of my favorite areas from the newer games. Some function like small, self-contained worlds with their own hub and spokes. To have more concrete data to analyze and compare the worlds, I counted and calculated various statistics for each one. We'll start with the most unexciting chart that shows the number of areas in each game. The games are shown in release order in each chart to spot possible trends. The takeaway here is that DS1 and 2 have many smaller areas, while the later games have a small number of larger areas. Demon's Souls does not spend time on optional areas, while almost half of Bloodborne's are optional. Looking at the absolute number of connections between locations, DS1 and 2 stand out. The next games fare better in the number of shortcuts inside areas. Sekiro has the most open areas and the freest movement, so it naturally has the least potential for traditional shortcuts. Instead, there are areas where you can jump around rooftops quite freely and access many parts of the level that way, in case you don't just warp there. DS3 has some open areas as well, and those tend to have the fewest shortcuts. The combined world complexity was the highest in DS1, and has been on a downward trend ever since. However, just the sheer number of connections does not tell everything. When counting them, the total number of areas plays a big part, as each area needs at least a single connection. We can get a better sense of the connectivity by looking at the average connectivity per area. DS2 falls to the last place when comparing the games that have interconnected worlds. As was discussed, Demon's Souls and DS2 are similar in this sense. DS1 clearly has the most connections between areas, while Bloodborne is the most efficient locally, with 1.6 shortcuts per area. The number of world connections has stayed the same for the last three games, while there's been a downward trend in local connectivity. This is not the whole story, as there are more metrics we can compare. While not the most relevant metrics for gameplay, I like comparing the ways you traverse between locations. Walking between the areas yourself does help the world feel more cohesive. However, different fast travel methods and cutscenes are a good way to travel to areas that need to be heavily distinct from the other parts of the world. Demon's Souls uses this to present five unique parts of the world, while DS1 and 3 use it to ascend to or descend from the high walls. Bloodborne uses this to present the various dreams and nightmares quite fittingly. The first metric counts the locations in the largest section of the world that are connected by walkable paths. For Demon's Souls, it's Politarian Palace, but this is meant to compare the games that are presented as interconnected. DS1 has some early and late game areas that are separated from the rest of Lordran, including Anor Londo, but it's physically so close that you could quickly walk there if the way there weren't blocked. All but the Lost Bastille and some multiplayer arenas are connected in DS2. In Bloodborne, 
Castle Canehurst and the Dream and Nightmare areas are separated from Yarnum. DS3 has two minor cutscene transitions, one to Arch Dragon Peak and one to the Kiln, and one large transition from the High Wall, which splits the map similar to DS1. Sekiro has two major areas with cutscene transitions, Hirata Estate and Fountainhead Palace. The next metric shows how many areas are separate from the main walkable section. The last two metrics summarize the number of walkable and warp slash cutscene connections. Again, it is more insightful to keep the total number of locations in mind, so here the metrics are shown as a percentage of the total areas. There doesn't seem to be any clear trend after the interconnected approach was adopted in DS1. Overall, you can explore most of these worlds by foot without interruptions. Paths available at the start of the game are hard to count, since the games start differently. Some have longer tutorials, or some restrictions before opening up. I tried to be fair here, especially to DS2 and the later games. For example, Bloodborne's world layout is quite close to the hub and spoke style of Demon's Souls and DS2, but you start at the end of one spoke, instead of the hub. So here I counted the paths available from the secondary hub of Cathedral Ward. Regardless, the downward trend is clear. You could look at viable paths for new players separately, since Demon's Souls and Dark Souls 1 have some that are clearly more difficult to even this out slightly. And again, keep in mind that the areas in the later games are usually larger, with some more paths inside the areas. If we expand our definition of start for the DS trilogy to the same extent as we did for the other games in the previous chart, the result would look like this. Due to the non-linear and interconnected start of DS1, many paths open up after the starting ones, especially with the master key. Starting paths are important considering replayability, as it's boring to always start the playthrough the same way. A non-linear start adds more scenario combinations and depth right away. However, it is not the only linearity metric, and not even that important if the rest of the game is more open. We're already familiar with bottlenecks, but to clarify, it means that a single area, or a set of areas, needs to be completed, or a key item is needed before the player can progress in the game. The fewer locations available at a time, the more linear the progress becomes. Dead ends are not as important, but illustrate how many separate branches are in the world, compared to looping connections to other areas. Also, it looks like DS2 is giving you the finger. Another important linearity measurement is how many areas are linearly connected to other areas, meaning that there is only one way into and one way out of the area, or that it's a dead end. Or let's say that it's important when you cannot warp and need to actually use the connections. With warping enabled, even areas with multiple connections will be effectively linearly connected after they have been accessed once. Thus, it makes more sense to compare linearly accessible areas instead. This means locations that can only be accessed by a single path when you arrive there for the first time. For example, Road of Sacrifices can only be accessed from Undead Settlement, making it linearly accessible, even though it later connects to Faron Keep and Cathedral of the Deep. Compare this to Darkroot Garden, which also has three connections, but can be accessed from all directions immediately. These values are biased against the worlds with more areas, so let's focus on the relative percentage values instead. This way, we can clearly see the trend of greatly increased bottleneck counts in relation to the number of areas in the newer games. The first three worlds are on an entirely different level in terms of giving the player a large number of areas to explore at a time, only having major choke points at the start, middle and end. Now DS2 is on the level of the newer games, when it comes to dead ends, and the first two games are clearly differentiated. The next metric highlights the similarity of layouts between Demon's Souls and DS2, which have linear spokes. Sekiro looks incredibly non-linear here, mainly due to a lack of smaller side areas, and a couple of extra connections between the locations. The more revealing metric is the relative percentage of linearly accessible areas. Nearly half of DS1's locations can be accessed multiple ways, while none of DS3's can, making it like Demon's Souls in this sense. DS2 is not far from this. For Bloodborne and Sekiro, 
this reveals that more than 70% of the areas are accessed linearly, even though they may later connect to more areas. You might be asking why I'm looking at this in a binary way. Either an area is linearly accessible or not. What about how non-linearly it can be accessed? How many different paths are there? Well, the comparison for this looks quite sad, since only DS1 has areas accessible by more than two paths. It actually has more accessible by four than by three paths. Looking at the averages, the result is quite close to an inverse of the linearly accessible areas chart. Sekiro fares a bit better, since it has three areas with two entryways. Keep in mind that the minimum value in this chart is one, since there needs to be at least one path to an area. Let's now create the new chart by putting the average connectivity per area on the horizontal axis and the relative number of bottlenecks on the vertical axis. This results in a 2D chart where we can place the worlds. If we divide the chart in the middle at average connectivity of 3 and at a 50% bottlenecks, we get a 2x2 archetype matrix with 4 quadrants. Quadrant 1 is the unconnected and linear gauntlet, where exploration and the order of completing areas is very straightforward. None of the worlds belong here, but the spokes in Demon's Souls and DS2 would fit, along with the endgame of Sekiro. I'll skip quadrants 2 and 4 for now. Quadrant 3 is unconnected and nonlinear, which describes the hub and spoke style of Demon's Souls and DS2. This archetype can be very nonlinear in terms of bottlenecks. You can do the spokes in any order, but the order inside them is linear. Talking about the linearity of accessing areas, we are not currently considering it, so let's fix this by taking the average of the relative number of bottlenecks and the linearly accessible areas and put it on the vertical axis instead. This changes the placement of the worlds in the quadrants, but only Demon's Souls and DS2 moved to a different quadrant. Or actually, it's more appropriate to say that the whole quadrant moved due to the redefinition of the vertical axis. So, now quadrant 1 is the hub and spoke section, and quadrant 3 is now a no man's land, as it's not possible to have a lot of nonlinear progress and low connectivity, at least by the definitions used here. You could get there with a very low bottleneck count, but it gets increasingly difficult as the average connectivity approaches too. Now let's see the other quadrants. Quadrant 2 is interconnected, but linear. This is where the modern Souls worlds made after DS2 go. The connectivity inside areas is high, and there are slightly more connections between areas than in the first quadrant. However, the progress is heavily gated, making it quite linear on the world level. Quadrant 4, interconnected and nonlinear, is the Dark Souls 1 archetype. These worlds have a large amount of freedom, but still some direction by a clever placement of bottlenecks. In this diagram, the linearity goes all the way to zero, but as mentioned, some is useful to have. It's a balancing act between too little and too much guidance. When this is done right, it's by far my favorite layout, and it's sad that no other Souls world captures this. There are some other interesting complexity and linearity metrics that could be studied. For example, the total number of orders you can complete the locations in the worlds, or the average branching factor that tells how many unbeaten locations are accessible to the player on average throughout the game. Calculating this would require some simulation, since the order of completing areas affects the result. For example, if you complete each book in Demon's Souls one at a time, there are 3.3 areas accessible on average. If you leave as many options as possible open, the average is about 4.4 instead. On a reasonable playthrough, the average is something in between, so around 3.9 when going by the recommended route in the wiki. I did not do the simulations, I just calculated the average for a single reasonable playthrough for each game, so take these as very rough estimates of the actual values. Demon's Souls and DS1 have the highest averages due to the low number of bottlenecks. There is a decline after this, but keep in mind that this is biased against the later games, with fewer but larger areas to choose from. To get a better idea of the number of paths inside areas, some further study is required. How many ways there are to arrive at the so-called end of each area would be one metric, but this is hard to measure for areas with multiple connections and for completely open areas. 
It may look like I am saying the Dark Souls 1 layout is perfect, but I'm mainly trying to show it had the right blend of freedom and direction, and that it's possible to expand on this. I'm trying not to play an armchair designer too much here, as heavy testing and iteration is always required to reach the design goal, and often an element will not fit, even if it seems interesting by itself. Actual development also has many constraints, like budgets and deadlines, but let's throw some ideas around anyway. Elden Ring may have a changing weather and time of day systems. Looking back at the possible area gameplay combinations, this would add two new modifiers to the formula. Depending on the ways these affect gameplay, the number of combinations is multiplied by some value. To speculate a bit on the different ways these systems would interact with other systems, given that they were close to DS1s, I added them and some interactions to the earlier DS1 system graph. For example, the day-night cycle could summon new enemies to patrol areas and change the behavior of existing ones. Maybe they wouldn't see so well in the dark, and so on. The same would apply to the player though, so they should be extra careful when exploring unknown places without a light source. Resting at the bonfire could cause time to pass, advancing the cycle. The weather could have various adverse effects on equipment and resource systems, causing them to degrade faster. There could be some helpful effects as well, such as the sound of the rain masking the sound of your footsteps, making it easier to sneak around. Or if you'd want to be mean, you could have the rain put out bonfires. What comes to the world layout, I would like the world to be quite freely explorable, but that does not need to mean that you can access everything from the start. Traveling between locations can be restricted in various ways in an open world as well, although some old leaks indicate that you can quite freely select the order you visit locations. Again, complete freedom is not needed to land on the fourth quadrant of the layout archetype matrix. It can be done while including some bottlenecks and more linear sections. Apart from the Souls series, good examples of semi-open worlds that are close to the evergreen quadrant include Zebes from Super Metroid and Hollow Nest from Hollow Knight. Zebes invisibly guides the player to complete the game quite linearly in the first half and then lets them explore more freely. It's a good example of having only a few large locations, but avoiding monotony by having some variability inside the areas and requiring the player to visit the areas multiple times, switching back and forth. The elevator rooms of the major locations form small hubs with spokes and looping paths. Hollow Nest is quite freely explorable after the start and focuses on making the various paths around the world worthwhile, instead of trying to guide you to a single direction. In both games, the intended progress routes can be deviated from by advanced knowledge and ability usage to access places early and to skip sections. In general, I'd like to see more dynamic, reactive worlds where systems are used to increase the sense of adventure and replayability by making the world more unpredictable. Causing areas to change, based on what areas you have completed before, can be used to prevent the difficulty level from dropping when the player becomes stronger. The inside system of Bloodborne did something in this vein by buffing some enemies or spawning new ones when the inside level was high enough. Sekiro changes the enemy encounters in Ashina Castle upon returning there after acquiring key items, while Demon's Souls has world tendency that affects difficulty and rewards. A more systemic approach would perhaps cause certain areas to be more heavily guarded after a boss is defeated, as they prepare for your arrival. This sounds like something Elden Ring could implement, as the rumors say that you can beat bosses in any order and acquire their powers. It would make sense to respond to this power increase by changing the challenges faced elsewhere. This would pose the player more things to consider when planning their route and build. Maybe draining an area of water would cause another one below it to fill, resulting in a different challenge. It's not out of the question to make locations that move. I think it would be fitting for someone named Miyazaki to add the moving castle to their game. Using existing systems to a fuller extent would be welcome too. The Daughters of Ash mod for DS1 does this in creative ways. An NPC takes away your warping ability and then uses a shortcut elevator right in front of you causing you to take the long way around. It also has a boss that flees and encounters you in later locations. Cleverly spawning enemies and blocking your favorite shortcuts is one way to make sure backtracking doesn't get boring. 
Let's see what the next mod from Grimrock and Co. have in store for us with the rearranged world of Nightfall. It's been almost 10 years since the release of Dark Souls 1. If Miyazaki and FromSoft wanted to make an interconnected world, they could. But it seems like Miyazaki likes to work on different types of worlds, which is fine by me. I'm looking forward to the innovations on open world design in Elden Ring. If fast travel is a must, I hope it's made more interesting than warping by applying some limitations and thematic flair. Like by making the travel require some resource, cause time to pass, be only allowed on set paths, and so on. While I've been waiting for a Souls world to come even close to Lord Run, other games with interesting worlds have come out. Worlds that require understanding of its mechanics include The Witness, Outer Wilds, and Toki Tori 2. They are masters of hiding things in plain sight. From the classic adventure game side, Riven and Obduction are also great with this. Trying to survive and explore the depths of Subnautica and Rain World include some of the tensest moments from the recent years. And perhaps the most memorable one was the first time I managed to land on the moon in Kerbal Space Program with the last drop of fuel in my trash can rocket. If you know of a world with an interesting layout or traversal mechanics, please comment below. Mods are also welcome. They can spice up the worlds that have more mundane navigation methods. Now I can get back to my game project. Surely, the next one I start will not have an unreasonably large scope to complete. Just like the one before that, and the one before that, and the previous one, and the one that came before that, and the one I was sure to finish, and the one where...